do that. That was so amazing. The ice just opened up for you to close. And I said, yeah, I said, there's a special way. I said, if you want to know that. I'm going to tell you a story. These stories all have a moral or lesson to them. So you will listen to the stories, see the elder, and then make the story come alive. The stories are very important because they're a part of our history, they're part of who we are, and they're part of where we come from. Our history, our language, everything's in the story. Yes. This culture is related to everything. It comes from water, land, people. At a very young age, he began telling me the story. It was my dad that told us the stories. My grandma and my great uncle taught me. What has happened to our stories is that each time an elder goes home, leaves here, where he takes those stories with him. The Arapaho language is an oral tradition. These stories were passed down to the children by the parents and grandparents. Oral storytelling is imprecise. Stories can change depending on the storyteller or what might have been happening to the tribe or family at that time. The stories you are about to hear represent what the individual storyteller heard as a child. The story is in no way representative of every tribal member's experience. Okay, the way I um, heard these stories is the way it was told to me. Now these same stories that maybe I told to you, other people out there were told the same story, but maybe it was told to them different than the way it was told to me. But the meaning is still the same, the lesson is still the same. There could have been variations to my story than to somebody out there that heard it. So they're all the same, but different people have heard it differently, and that's the way they remember it, and that's how they tell it. Arapaho Truths. Arapaho Truths. The Northern Arapaho people of the Wind River Indian Reservation of Wyoming are storytellers, much like other Native American peoples in the Western Hemisphere. The stories evolved over generations to instruct the community, especially the children, about their relationships, their children, and their natural environment. Secondly, these truths provided entertainment and provided instruction for them to live morally grounded lives in their world. By sharing the Northern Apple truths of storytelling. I'm gonna talk about uh, children. Coupled with the artistic interpretations of today's students, we hope to play a significant part in keeping our truths alive. I was raised in a traditional manner by my mother and father, and my sister got hurt very badly, and they had to go to Casper, Wyoming, to be with her. I stayed with my uncle. And interestingly, my uncle had been burned at 10 months so that he never experienced walking or running with other children. So a lot of his time was sitting with the elders and they gave him the stories and the language and the songs. He told me stories about, you know, when the animals could talk. He told me st stories um, about uh, adventure, you know, and um, 
From these stories, you know, I found out that our ancestors lived in a world of magic. The Bear Who Lost His Tail. The Bear Who Lost His Tail is a generationally old Arapaho truth that was shared with young children and more importantly, this taught lifelong lessons, acknowledging elders and all living things. A long, long time ago, way in the past, a bear, his name is Wuch. He had long tail like all our regular animals and a long and beautiful tail. One winter time, the bear was walking along the river, ice all around, snow all the way around. He was hungry, the bear was hungry, looking for food. He would stop and sniff the air, smell food, look around, listen. Pretty soon he came around, he seen some, something sitting on the ice over there. I wonder what he's doing, he said. I smell fish, he said. I smell my supper, he said. Pretty soon this fox got up, got up from the ice. A red fox, they call him Bechu. On his tail were a bunch of fish. He cleaned them off, put them on the side. Pow was piling up. So the bear went over to the fox. Hey, brother, he said. It's me, it's me, brother bear. I see you have a lot of food here. Can you share some of the fish with me? I'm very, very hungry, he said. The fox looked at him and said, Hika. That means no. It took me all day to catch these fish. It's hard work, he said. You can do the same thing I'm doing here. It's called fishing, he said. Okay, show me how to fish, the bear told the fox. Go find a big rock. On the ice here, make a hole in the ice. Once you get a hole in there, big enough for your face to get tail in there. He said, sit down there and be patient. The bear was a little hype over there. He stuck his big, big long, beautiful tail in there. He sat there for a while, the bear, you know, having thoughts of food. Boy, I wanna eat, I wanna eat tonight, good tonight, he said. Meanwhile, the fox packed up his fish and went home. The bear was thinking about, his, about the food he was gonna eat. Pretty soon, he was so tired he fell asleep. He started to snore. Pretty soon, stars start coming out, getting dark. The bear finally woke up. Hey, he said, what am I doing here? What am I doing here sitting on, this one on, on, on the river here? He said, oh, he said, oh yeah, I was fishing, he said. I must have a lot of fish on my tail now, he said. So he was going to check. He tried to get up, something was wrong. He couldn't move. Oh, something wrong here, he said. And he had, he started getting scared. He said, boy, maybe it's, maybe I want to starve to death there. I'm be trapped here in the ice. I can't, I can't break loose. Maybe nobody will find me. He said, he kept trying all kinds of ways. Couldn't, couldn't get his tail off, frozen to the ice. He was struggling for about maybe an hour or so, trying to get his tail. I returned there, which way, and heard his tail. Finally, he said, well, I'm going to try this one more time, he said. So with all his strikes, he pulled real hard. Big old snap, we heard a mile away. He went bouncing, rolling over like that. Head over heels, he finally stopped. He said, boy, he said, I'm free. He said, I'm real happy, smiling around. Free bear and I said, hey, something wrong, he said. I wonder what's wrong. He looked around, I'm missing something, he said. He looked around, hey, my tail is gone, he said. Went over there, his tail was frozen to ice. So the bear, he lost his tail that day. He also lost his supper. But from that day forward, all bears, even to this day, have short tails. That is the story of how the bear lost his tail. Ho ho, thank you. You know, a lot of the stories, um, they they were told in the winter time, and you know in the winter time, back then you, you know you were you were enclosed in your home most of the time because it was cold, and you know there was no technology, no no television or or anything for entertainment, and this storytelling was was a form of entertainment. But yet the stories had uh, had a meaning behind behind it that help the person understand life. The Moon, Sun, and Wives is a short story which was originally told by the Arapaho chief, Yellow Calf. This is the history of Chief Yellow Calf. Chief Yellow Calf was born on August 13th, 1861. He was the last Arapaho chief and served on the business council 
for 25 years. He was successful in persuading the federal government to end the ban of the Sundance. He sold some land to establish St. Michael's Episcopal Mission and supported the mission for the rest of his life. He was instrumental in forming the new community of Ethity. He was an important traditional leader and founded the Crow Dance, Dog Dance, also known as God's Dance. He was very well respected by the tribe and his work kept many Arapaho traditions alive. The Moon, Sun, and Wives is a short story which was originally told by the Arapaho chief, Yellow Calf. The story utilizes humor to explain to children the dark markings on the face of the moon. Sun, Moon, and Wives. The Moon, Sun, and Wives. The sun and moon were married to frogs. One day the moon and the sun said, Let us have our wives cook together. Whoever cooks good will be a good wife, but whoever cooks bad will be not a good wife. So the frog started cooking. The moon's wife cooked good. But the sun's wife didn't cook so good. The moon criticized the sun's wife. Your wife didn't cook good, the sun's wife said. If you're going to say I did not cook good, I will not like you. For that, I'm going to jump in your face, and I'm going to be there forever. You will see me in your face always as the face of the moon. When you look at the moon, you see a black scene in there. It looks like a frog. If you look at it for a long time. It looks like you're seeing a frog moving its legs because it jumped in the moon. You know, it's real neat to wake up, you know, just hearing the old folks in the morning during breakfast talking their native language and we come in and uh, that's when most of the storytelling would take place, you know, during breakfast time, in, in my house anyways. A lot of it had to do with uh, uh, Indian values, you know, about being honest, having integrity, uh, being respectful, and really being true to yourself. It seems like most of those uh, stories and those creation myths always come back to that one point. Okay, everybody's looking at the camera, smiling, and... The Creation Story. The Arapaho Creation Story is sacred to the Arapaho people. The entire story can be shared by ceremonial people and elders during certain times within the year. This version has been published in books and appears on the internet. Recognized community elder William C. Hare received approval for this story to be retold. It has been modified and shortened to respect the wishes of the tribe and to recognize the sacredness and eternal truth of the story. In the very beginning of our time, water was everywhere. There was no land, just water. And on this water, there was an individual that was selected. After floating aimlessly for a long period of time, then he was instructed if he was able to obtain bits of soil, the earth, that he would be given instruction as to how land would once again appear and the water, the water would recede. 
he was able to communicate with all of the, the birds and, and he would ask them to help him. He would ask for help. He didn't know where to go to get this sword or how to get it. But each one that uh, tried was unable. Eventually, he came upon a small turtle. So the turtle went under the water. He uh, got the turtle and he examined the turtle. In a small bitty claws of this turtle, he said there was pieces of mud. After the mud had dried, the person, the, the deity, the god that uh, instructed him told him, now you take bits and pieces of this now dirt and throw it in either direction. Wherever you throw it, so land will, will appear. So every way that he threw the uh, grains of earth, land appeared. And then he would walk on the earth and look around see what was there, vegetation had, had evolved, creatures had, had evolved, different species of creatures had evolved. There was a creature there that, that was very, very fierce looking. They would chase him, he would run from them, he was afraid of them. And so he, he would make it back to his, to the water, the edge of the water, back on his raft. He was once again given instruction. He was told that he would cut from a certain tree, a piece of that tree, and make a stick. And then he was told, when, when the stick is all done, now you go out, you go out once again. When these creatures see you, he said, don't run, don't run from them, just stand there and hold your ground. So when the creatures approached him, when the stick began to move, he, he would knock out all of these strange looking fierce creatures when, when he had them all down. And then once again, the voice of the creator gave him instructions. The instructions were wipe, uh, wipe off the, uh, the creatures to obtain some red paint and then to paint the faces of these creatures that, that evolved to what is now our people. In the group there was male and there was female. So as they multiplied, the, uh, the tribes had started. After so long, once again, he was told to take this turtle and this turtle would help him. They would find a place where they would live in peace. And then he went east and he continued down and he come to a place where little men live on trees that have tails. It is believed that this one here would be some place in the area of what is now South America. In the meantime, different groups of people in various locations, they would drop off. They would, maybe they got tired of, of wondering they would drop off. That was the beginning of the various tribes. So so he travels around the continent. Once he can't find it, and then he goes a little bit further inland. And then finally, when he gets to, to the top, and then that's when he it's re revealed that the, the back of the turtle was actually a map for him to find the place where they would live in peace, live in harmony. And this is the way the story goes. When I was little, I'd go over to my grandpa's house. He taught me a lot of stories. The way he described and did the detail, you know, I could like, when I was a kid, I could close my eyes and just picture what he was talking about. Like my grandpa always told me, these stories tell you who you are. You know, these stories have a good connection with you because they're not only just words coming out of somebody's mouth, but they're a whole culture, you know, they're a whole tradition um, and a way of life now. To me, it's a very strong culture. It's very um, unique as well, and I'm very proud to be a Northern Rapo. You know, it's my identity. It's who I am. It's um, it shaped me into the person I am today, and who I will be in the future. You know, it's my people, and I'm, you know, I'm blessed to be Northern Rapo. Star Girl is another Rapo truth that is beautiful, eloquent, and spiritually connected. It is shared to explain the wonders of the universe. The Arapaho truth, Star Girl, also foretold the advent of space travel. Star Girl. My grandma's home was a log house, one big log, one big room log house. She had no running water, no electricity. To light the house, she had these old style kerosene lanterns, and they would burn liquor, and she'd boil this tea for us. Metal cups, these enamel cups, pour the tea in it. Then we'd sit there, then she'd tell us these stories. A story that I really remember being 
really enthused about was Stargirl. My brothers and sisters would, we would all sit around the table with my cousins, and she began telling us this. She told us a long, long time ago, this girl would always go out every evening. She'd leave her teepee, go out, sit outside, and she'd always gaze up into the sky. She'd become fascinated by these stars. She was fascinated the way they blink, flicker, change in different colors. She lay back on her back. Then her mother called her in to go to bed. Chite Madonna. Hayona ah. One evening she went out and she became attracted to this one star. Every time she'd go out there, she'd look for it, she'd find it. And it was on her mind all the time, even during the day when she was awake. She'd always think about the star, of how it would twinkle, how it got her attention, the colors that it would flicker off and on, and the brightness of it. It stood out from all of the other stars that was up there. One evening, she went out and did the same thing. She looked up and she found it right away. She's leaning back and just gazing. Then all of a sudden, the star that she uh, fell in love with started coming closer and closer, started moving. It was coming closer and closer to her. As soon as it came to her, it was really bright and it took her, took her straight up. She was never heard from or seen from again from her family. The moral of that story was, when my grandma was done telling us the story, she said, one of these days, she said, they're going to find a way to go up into space, which they did. The United States went up there, circled the Earth in a spaceship. They went further, they went to the moon. Now, they're exploring Mars. But at that time, she said, they're smart. They're gonna find a way to go out into space. And when they get out there, they're gonna find people like us. They're gonna find Arapaho people up there in one of those planets. I think if we lose those stories, we, we lose a big part of their heritage. I think heritage, culture, and language are inseparable. I think we have to preserve all three, or we'll lose all three. If you have a voice, speak it. If you got ears, you could listen. Sit down, talk to your elders, or anything like that. Then, at least try. If we believe, you know, believe that the stories can live and carry on, you know, that, you know, that's the key to um, carrying our, our way of life. Well, the way the old people talk, you know, it'll be the end of this world, but we have to be ready for the next one. We're going to go into the next one. That's why it's important to keep our knowledge of the land, of the animals, and understand it. If we lose this, the world will still turn. But what a precious part we'll lose. It is important that the collective stories and truths remain alive by the telling and retelling each story is born anew the Arapaho stories will continue as long as there are community people to share and tell them and community children to listen <laughs>